today's gospel, you know, it's the famous story of Nicodemus. And, you know, it's usually interpreted in just one way. You know, one very common way. And it says, basically, that Nicodemus saw what Jesus was doing, and he wanted to know more, but that he didn't want anyone else to know. That, you know, that he, being a respected rabbi, that he didn't want the other rabbis to know, because he was afraid about what they would think if he was seen with Jesus. And so told in this way, it has Nicodemus seeming to sneak around at night, kind of shady, you know, looking over his shoulder, you know, wearing sunglasses at night, kind of incognito to meet Jesus, tiptoeing through the night. And so sometime during their conversation, Nicodemus, you know, he finds his voice and he goes on to be a friend of Jesus, to speak out for him, and eventually to anoint him at his burial. And really it's portrayed as a fear to courage transition. And, you know, and, and that's one way to look at it. But there's also another way to look at it as well. And a few years ago, you know, I heard it preached this way, and it moved me. And it stuck with me to this day. You know, and the feeling that it brought, I just cannot describe. And so I very much wanted to share it with you. And so I give thanks and credit to Reverend Duane for this message today. So there is another way to look at this story. You know, the Word never tells us why Nicodemus went at night. It's only assumed that it was because he was afraid. You know, but for today, let's give him a little bit more credit than that. So Nicodemus, you know, he sees what Jesus is doing. He sees the things that he's saying, and it challenges him. It challenges Nicodemus in such a way that his mind is captivated. These miracles and these signs, these healings, this baffling teaching, you know, he's intrigued to that point of pure excitement, so much so, that whenever the day ends, his mind just won't let go of it. He keeps thinking about it, and he just can't sleep. And the more he thinks about it and thinks about it, you know, he feels something happening inside of him. And the excitement is building, and it's building, and he just can't wait for the sun to come up. He can't wait for the morning birds to sing their song, because he needs to meet with Jesus now. He's filled with that hunger, with anticipation and excitement like never before. And excitement, you know, usually did not live in the stern traditions of the church at the time. You know, Nicodemus is a very well-respected uh, rabbi. He's a member of the ruling council. So he has a clear, clear idea of how life should be, how people and things should work. You know, but with Jesus, you know, he sees a new wind moving in. He sees a new spirit blowing. And he finds himself laying awake at night thinking about the possibilities. I mean, it's the possibilities for his own life. You know, what, what Jesus could mean for his future. And what about the possibilities for the church? What would happen, you know, if the church became a place of liberation and of true intent? What if the miraculous signs that Jesus was doing could be multiplied throughout the church? How might things change? There's so many questions, yet so many hours until morning. And he just couldn't wait. You know, have you ever felt that way before? Have you ever had a Nicodemus moment where you just couldn't sleep? You know, I remember being a kid, and, and every time our, plan, you know, our family planned a trip to Six Flags or the beach, I remember just itching to go. Like, I just couldn't wait to go. So the night before, I didn't sleep. You know, I, I laid in my bed, imagined the waves. I'd get up and pretend to need water. Like, all kinds of stuff. Because I just wanted to go so bad. You know, and I know as a kid, whenever you were a kid, you know, like Christmas Eve, you remember what it's like, that excitement and that magic the night before. When I was a kid, we used to sneak down sometimes because we couldn't wait, and we'd unwrap the presents and rewrap them by morning. <laughs> But as an, as an adult, you know, there's some things, you know, that also come up, you know, so, that put us in that place. You know, sometimes, you know, it's a big trip that's coming up. You know, it keeps you awake. Maybe it's an early flight. Maybe you're having a cruise. Maybe, you know, it's a meeting with an old friend. It's a graduation, starting school. You know, what about, you know, that night before that first day? You know, you finally have the courage to ask them out, and you're ready. But the trouble is, it's the next night. It's not tonight. And so, you know, you're laying in bed and you're thinking, what you going to wear? Where are you going to go? How many times are you going to kiss? And, you know, <laughs> and so the more that you think about it, you want to go now. You want to go now. And so you look over at the clock and it's 
2 a.m. And then you answer the phone, and man, I really want to talk to them. Do I dare call at this hour? I wonder if they're laying awake and thinking about me, too. <laughs> what about when you start a new job? Or college, you know, you're so excited. You know, it took you months, you know, to find the right one, and every other one that you've had has led up to this one. How will the other people be? Hope I'm how, how and I hope that I make a great impression. My gosh, I'm just so excited for the morning that I just can't sleep. Nicodemus couldn't sleep either, and so after laying awake half the night, he finally says, "You know what? I am gonna go now." I am going to have this conversation now. I can't wait for what God is going to do in my life, and I don't know what it's going to look like, but I want to get there now and find out. Now, if you look at the culture of this time, this could be very likely. You see, there was a very strong emphasis on to study and to learn and to grow in God. It was very common for the rabbis to study the Torah late into the night. And the idea was that the distractions and the noise of the day could be put to rest so that um, the people could be more open, you know, to listen to the spirits, you know, to be more open for that movement of God. And it was so highly valued in that culture that in the synagogues they had priests whose specific jobs was, were to be night priests. You know, they were assigned different tasks to pray throughout the night, you know, when the spirit could really move, you know, they, they prayed for those that were sleeping and those that were studying, you know, that they might learn the ways of God. And maybe it was those prayers that reached Nicodemus that got the spirit moving. You know, that spirit that called him to rise up and to go and meet with Jesus right now. And so he does. And what we know about Nicodemus, you know, his education, being a Pharisee, being on the ruling council, you know, we know that he likes things very structured. He likes it spelled out and followed. And he was ready for something new. I mean, that's why he's going, hoping for something transformative. And he thought that, yes, Jesus, you know, was going to give him something new. But he thought that it would be something that would be structured in some way, too. I mean, all of the religion and the teachings of the time very much were. What he was looking for was a formula. He was looking for a faith equation. If you do X and Y, then your faith's going to multiply. But that's not what he gets. Instead, Jesus shifts and moves like the sea. As they get into the conversation, instead of Jesus rolling out a specific plan, he talks about the idea of being born again, born from above. Now, you know, with such a, a practical and logical mind as Nicodemus, you know, this certainly is a challenging conversation for him. You know, with Roger, I, I understand this type of mind. You know, sometimes I ask him questions like, how do you feel about that? And I kind of get a blank stare back at me, you know, because for him, it's not about feelings. It's about information, you know, which is why he puts the Spock picture up during the congregational meetings when it's his turn. <laughs> but with such a practical mind, Nicodemus, you know, he asks the kind of question that you might or might not expect. Born again? Well, how do I get back in the womb and come out again? I don't even fit. What are, you, what are you talking about? How is this even possible? So rather than answer the question in a clear, concise way, Jesus gives a powerfully moving, soul-swaying answer. He speaks of water, and he speaks of wind, and he speaks of spirit. <coughs> Things that can't be touched, but that are very real. You know, Jesus calls him to an experience that Nicodemus himself could have never even imagined. And I think that we have a lot to learn from this story. You know, we have a tendency, you know, as, as people of faith to want structure, you know, a format, if you will. You know, we want our faith path to be lined out. Just tell us how to be, tell us how to get there so we can feel safe and secure. Just, just tell us how. And I think that, you know, many denominations and committees and boards, they line out, you know, so many details, you know, so that they can be assured. But the trouble with that is that they are only being assured of what they already know. You see, they and us want to feel comfortable doing what we know and knowing where it leads. 
in times of trouble, we just want to say, you know, just, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. You know, just, just give me a list, I'll check it off, I'll fix each one, and then I'm going to know I'm okay. Just, just give it to me. But Jesus Christ says in the scripture, that's not how it happens. You know, Jesus, you know, is saying that, you know, as much as we want it to be that way, that's just not how it works. Instead, Jesus is giving us an invitation, you know, to trust what we cannot see and to discover what you do not yet know. And he's inviting you to something that's just for you. It's personal. It's unique. You know, and after all, each of us is born that way. We're, we're unique, we're different, and we're varying. So there's no formula or format or equation or list that is going to work. Instead, you are called to open yourself to the wind. To open yourself to the Spirit. To something new. And then to see what happens. To let go and throw caution to the wind. So born again, it's not so much going down to the altar, shadowed by guilt and shame. Rather, born again is opening your mind and your body and your soul up to the breeze of the Spirit. And it comes with unpredictable challenges, and those come from us being vulnerable, and that's when we become real. And that's the heart of our faith. It cannot be summed up in a formula. You know, we can't all line up like little ducks following one another, running out of fear of having our feathers plucked out when we make a mistake. It's so much more than that. Marcus Borg writes that the born-again experience can be sudden and it can be dramatic. It can involve a revelation, a life-changing epiphany, such as the case with Paul on the road uh, to Damascus. You know, in such dramatic conversations, continued con conversions continue to this day, he writes. Some people can name the day or the hour when it happened. You know, but for the majority of us, he says, being born again is not a single intense experience, but it's a gradual and incremental process. Dying to an old identity and being born into a new identity. Dying to an old way of being and living into a new way of being. And it's a process that continues through a lifetime. Being born again is the work of the Spirit. And it's important to note that whether it's suddenly or gradually, we cannot ourselves make it happen. Either by strong desire or determination, or even by learning and believing the right beliefs, we can't make it happen. Yet we can be intentional about being born again. Though we can't make it happen, we can midwife the process. This is the purpose of spirituality, you know, to help birth the new self and to nourish new life. In short, he says, spirituality is about the process of being born again and again and again. And it's so beautifully written, you know, and I love this because, you know, salvation and wholeness cannot be summed up in an equation, but rather it is just a way of life. Salvation and wholeness is not a doctrine, but it is a story. It is not a, a pre-written contract, but a relationship to be discovered. It's the essence of the living God who's here with us every day and right now. And that's exciting. It's enough to, to keep us awake at night, knowing that God is, is a personal God who wants to relate to us as the exact people that he created us to be. Not as a manufactured shell of a Christian, created by a formula by people fighting over the idea of what it should be. That's not what Jesus speaks of here. It's a loving relationship to which we are born again and again and again. One of the questions we know Nicodemus had in the back of his mind was, is he the one? And what proof can I find? So like, Nic like us, like Nicodemus found that day, we find that all the proof that we need is already blowing inside of us. So, so while there's, there's not a formula, there are tools and there are approaches that can help you get there. One is to be sure that you remain open. Open to each day just to see what God will do, where he will take you when you finally throw that caution to the wind. You know, meet that friend after all. Amend your schedule easily. Quit pretending to know. 
travel lightly and shake off your fear of looking foolish. Throw caution to the wind. And part of what opens the door to openness is finding a place beyond the noise, above all the rigmarole of the day. You know, with such technology and busyness, and we get trapped in the su superficiality that the world presents to us. And we buy in at the cost of our spiritual gain. So on one hand, you know, we are called to community, to dialogue, to celebrate together. But on the other side of that, we are called to find those places of listening, those places of silence. So I have a challenge for you. Now, it's not a formula, but it's a tool to help, you know, invoke the spirit into your multifaceted faith experience. And it's an invitation to us all. Now, I know some of us are accustomed to falling asleep with the TV on, Roger. <laughs> I'm on you today, but, but I want you to try something, you know, 15 minutes before bed, I want you just to turn the TV off. Now, I know, I know, just get over it, it's only 15 minutes. Throw caution to the wind, turn off Letterman, turn off Kimmel, and you need to turn it off because it's important, because it could be blocking what God is trying to say to you. You know, how, how, will, you, how will you hear the Spirit over jokes about Snooky? You know, you need to be listening. So I want you to take 15 minutes to have a Nicodemus moment. Study some scripture, you know, maybe a devotional. Even if it's one verse, read it, ponder it, feel the silence, and then ask a question. And allow yourself to go into a night place and specifically tell yourself that it can become a spirit place. Now, I want you to take a 3 by 5 index card, and during that 15 minutes, I just want you to hold it before God. And then write a question or a thought to God on it, and it can be anything you want. So maybe you want resolution, maybe you have questions. And then before you go to bed, put it under your pillow or on the nightstand, and then say, God, you know, you, you know what kind of crazy day that it's been. You know, there's so many things that are just swirling around in my life and in my day. But right now, God, I'm going to go to sleep. And I'm going to be open. And I pray that while I'm asleep, that you'll just massage my heart and love me while I sleep. And if you have something to say to me, God, either in the night or in the morning, let me be open to it, to hear what you might have to say. And in the morning, even if you didn't think you heard anything, I want you to pull out your card, pick up a pen, and begin to write a response. Even if you don't know what you're going to write, because that is often when it will come. It's when you give him a median to share his voice. And you'll be amazed at what the Spirit just might do. Now, I did this last night, and I want to share with you how it went. God, you know I care for my mom in the happy yet trying days that I have. How long will I be here doing this and tell me how I can do it better when my flaws rear their head? John, I never expected you to be perfect. Cut yourself some slack. I already have. Remember that my yoke is easy, and if you serve with my nature, then your burdens will be light. How long will you be there, you ask? Remember your call to greatness and know that what's a few more years when you're going to spend an eternity with your mom and me? This time, though, when you get here, I'll be serving you, and I can't wait to wash your feet, John. I call on you to measure your time there serving, not in minutes or in years, but in moments of love accrued. Every day you are there, you are becoming more and more like my son. Ah, and John, even in your imperfections, you make me so proud. Love God. Now, I'm going to pass out these cards for you to take home to help you get started, and you know, it is my prayer that that you'll have a Nicodemus moment, that, you know, the Spirit will, will come upon you, that, that you'll be able to throw caution to the wind, throw some structure out, and just go with the flow.